Okay, so follow up question for your vision on the future of nurseries. I remember at, earlier in the podcast you were mentioning the the aspect of physical fitness in and how you want to incorporate that or how it should be incorporated into universities. Is that something that you guys incorporate into your nursery? And also, I I want you to talk about the experience that the kids get in the garden and also the importance of being connected with nature and some of the activities they do like planting. And while I was at my grandma's nursery, we had rabbits and we had chickens. And I think it was important for me to you know interact with those animals and it was a cool experience. So do you mind just talking about that? Yeah. Um, so just on the, on the physical, uh, physical dimension, I think absolutely the way I see this is this is not a, and should not be a fixed, uh, system of education. It should evolve with, uh, the, the needs and the, uh, the reality that we're in. So what, what's an example of that? I use the physical dimension as an example. Um, and the reason I use that example is when we look at pedagogical theory in the alternative space, it might not come up very frequently. And I think the reason for that is if you go back a hundred years ago when the, the Montessori method was I mean, starting to, to, to emerge when Maria Montessori was developing, um, and, and refining her system. I would imagine that the children that she was around, you know, were walking a lot during the day and physical fitness might not have been something that was a concern. And why, why is walking so important? Just because our bodies were designed in such a way that we used to walk a lot. So things work better, uh, when, when we walk, um, and so if today children are growing up in, you know, an apartment, getting driven to school, driven here, driven there, and they're not getting those steps in. That's something that we should look at going back to what are the needs of children and are they, are they being met and then incorporate them into, into the, the curriculum. And I use that example as just because it wasn't there doesn't mean it's, it shouldn't be. Um, because now children have a different lifestyle than they did a hundred years ago. Right? So that's just the, the broad and, uh, 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 the broad, uh, background for that, uh, that particular point. Um, right now at, at, at this age group, um, there is a lot of movement. And so that particular one is, is I think relatively well addressed, uh, the spaces we have the system itself, which is that children move around the classroom. We don't have desks where you sit at, uh, you sit in all day or constant. Remember that circle time I was speaking about many nursery concepts are based primarily on circle time all, all day long, or most of the day. Um, in this classroom, the children are always up and down the classroom, picking up a shelf from a, a material from a shelf, moving it to somewhere where they find a spot on a carpet or on a, on a rug or on a table, working with it, bringing it back. So there's a lot of carrying, walking, etc. And then, then we, all our campuses have large gardens. That's part of our, um, uh, our approach. And so they get a lot of, and they get a lot of time out in the garden. So there's a lot of moving around and activities, you know, bicycles, uh, that they can use, uh, uh, balancing beams and, uh, and uh, other types of uh, physical play. I think later on, when you look at the schools where you're sitting, you know, five, six hours behind the desk and getting this one hour of sports, I think that's where we should 
start looking at how to integrate uh, sports and physical activity more into the into the system and that should be one dimension i think there should be a baseline of being able to walk we can agree you know x number of kilometers by this age if you're a teenager um, you know a thousand years ago walking to the well of the village to get water was something you did maybe every day um, and if that's optimal for our health uh, today then and that's that's where we want to get to at age you know middle school then how do we build that up uh, to, to to get to there um, from that point if then someone wants to become a marathon runner you know an iron man uh, or woman that's something else but just as a baseline of health being able to walk uh, a few uh, kilometers uh, every day, uh, if that's a baseline, then that should be integrated. Um, on a, just to give another example, just to paint how this this looks like, and it could go to all dimensions. Um, one of the books, or one of the uh, the meditation centers or philosophers uh, that I follow and read. Um, remember this one story around something around when meditation was invented you're talking thousands of years ago you've got to imagine that imagine a, imagine a place where you're in a village and you don't see strangers maybe for weeks and suddenly you know one day someone comes and it's it's a big event you know who's this person and People are asking them, you know, like, hey, what's, you, oh, you travel village to village, you know, like, what's going on? What goes on there behind the mountains? And, and so give us the news, like, you know, because our lives, our routines, they're the same, N not much changes every day. And so give me information. And in that context, if we say sit still and meditate, that might not be something very difficult to do. Fast forward uh, many years later, and um, uh, you're bombarded with information. Your head is, you know, overloaded with info left, right, and center. Uh, the ability to sit still and meditate might be extremely difficult, you know, and it is for many people. And uh, what this this um, approach was talking about was, you know, the need for dynamic meditation as a as a transition. So how do you meditate while walking or while doing sports or while remaining active? And so, to me, that's an example of how do you adjust um, education to the reality of where we are uh, today and how do you do that across many different dimensions the need itself for quiet time might not have been you know so high but today the need for quiet time uh, without a dopamine hit is critical i think for uh, for sanity um, so that's another dimension that that should be integrated and that is something that we have in the past, uh, we, we did integrate uh, into the school these showing children these moments of quiet time, and or we have a whisper whisper day where we try to make the the, the, the classroom as quiet as possible, um, just to experience what it's like to to take a break. So those on two very different dimensions. Those are examples of as life evolves, as the reality of students the context they're in changes so too has the has the system uh should the system change as well i think that the universal principles remain the same how do you prepare but then how do you uh you might need to do things a little bit differently uh, as 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 things evolve um the connection to nature i think it started off with just that's how my mom grew up uh, she grew up around animals. Um, you know, they had a, 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 a large, um, active garden where they had their chickens, they had their vegetables and fruits that they were growing. Um, we come from a culture where, you know, farming is extremely important. Um, so, uh, and she wanted, she knew 
how important these things were for children, and she wanted them to, to her students to be exposed to to animals and nature. And over the years, we've had everything from uh, the school um, uh, goat to turtles, uh, rabbits, chickens, um, plant, and then of course planting our own vegetables. And it's it's completely different, a completely different experience to have a child where you teach them, you know, a tomato from a flashcard. So this is a picture of a tomato and a picture of a banana, a picture of an apple, and you have them say it to you um, versus here's a real tomato. And today we're going to carve out the seeds. We're going to, you know, and we're going to make a salad with the tomato, eat the tomato, etc., and then take those seeds, plant them in um, our, our pots in the garden, and then we're going to water them. And a few days later, we're going to see a shoot, you know, shoots coming out of the ground. And then eventually something green uh, will come out, we'll taste them, we'll see that they don't taste good. So we're going to have to wait until they're ripe. So you're learning language as well. And then finally a red tomato comes out again. And you take that tomato back to the class, carve out the seeds and make a salad. And they understand the cycle of the tomatoes. And then you show them one other so that they don't think it's, it's just about tomatoes. You show them one other maybe a cucumber or something like that. And then, then that, I think that's one of the secrets of education. You go deep with um, a couple of examples where you understand the full cycle and then the child can carry on and project that out, you know, for all the fruits and vegetables. They understood the cycle of how things grow versus, and in the beginning, it seems a bit slower, right? So I could sit a child down and go through the flashcards. Child one is going is planting a tomato. Child two is going through the flashcards of all the fruits and vegetables. It and then on a test looks like child two is doing better. That child can say banana, apple, orange, etc. But they don't know what a tomato smells like, tastes like, where it comes from, right? The other child, you're spending more time going a bit deeper, um, and then eventually, once you're done, then you can go to the flashcards and you can say, "Hey, you saw those two." This applies to all of these in slightly different ways, and they will both go to an exam now and get an A. But once they get to real life, child one is way more prepared than child two. And that's an example of why grades, you know, don't necessarily mean what people think uh, they mean. You can have some, some kids that are really switched on. They understood the root principles because they're curious of a certain subject and they get an A on the test or they get the root principles and they don't like this whole story of regurgitating and they don't get an A on the test, but that they did learn the subject. And then you have kids who will memorize and then forget and get an A and haven't learned, uh, or they think even worse, they think they know the subject and they go out to the world and, and the real world and they're just rattling off things they've memorized without really understanding um, how to use them in the right context and, and how to think about them. Um, so yeah, so nature is, is critical for us. It's part of our, our, uh, core curriculum, um, and how we choose our locations, 